My name is Gareth Henry, and I was the former um, co-chair for the Jamaica Forum for Lesbians, or Sexos, and Gays um, between 2004 and up until 2008, after which I had to flee to Canada to seek refugee protection there. Um, so JFLAG, um, you know, as it is, is the only um, LGBT um, organization in the Caribbean that act, not the Caribbean, sorry, in Jamaica that actively, uh, let us look at my Caribbean colleagues across there. Because <laughs> oftentimes we think that in the Caribbean, Jamaica is the Caribbean, which is so hard, and that's what they said. Yeah, so it's in Jamaica. So um, JFLAG has been around for, um, since 1998, and I was involved as a volunteer you know, at a very early age. Um, with the organization because I believe that you know gays and lesbians have the right to be who they are within any context in which you know um, society may, may create or not and um, so um, in 2004 when the former leader for, for JFLAG was brutally murdered uh, I was 24 years old and I decided to to take on um, the, the, a huge challenge and a huge task to become the, the, the voice for the gay community in Jamaica and as a result of that, uh, it actually changed my life forever, uh, where I became the target of violence, primarily because I was a voice who, one who would um, be in the media talking about the issues uh, affecting gays and lesbians in Jamaica, and also be the person who constantly uh, challenging the police to, to become more responsive to the issues that gays and lesbians are facing. Um, because of that level of activism, I, you know, I had to be, I had to live, um, you know, in hiding for most most part of it. Sometimes I have to be moving from one location to the other, and I've uh, been physically been abused by the police uh, on three different occasions, where they would turn up at my apartment and they will um, beat me uh, for because of the work that I was doing. Um, the, the most challenging uh, uh, situation I've had was on um, February 14, 2007, where I was beaten by four police officers in front of 200 people, and um, you know when this all this was happening, it you know it it reminded me of many other incidents that I have experienced and have witnessed, where my fellow gay men and lesbians have been the victim of homophobic violence. And you know I remembered uh, on that day, one of my colleague Victor Jarrett, um, a young guy, 24 years old, who was beaten up by four some police officers on the beach. Um, you know, in you know, Resort City, which is Montego Bay, and um, you know, he was on the beach just like everybody else, having a great day swimming. And um, the police officers ordered him off the beach because you know, they said that he's a homosexual. And because of he resisted, they started to beat him. And a crowd gathered and then said to the police officers, "Hand him over. Let us finish him." And the police officers threw Victor to this angry mob of people. And um, two hours after. Uh, it was on you know, front uh, headline news on, 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 on major newspapers that alleged homosexual beaten and killed by angry mob. And that pained my heart. And when I was in that pharmacy that day on February 14th and was the victim of violence by the police, that's the only thing that I could remember because it was the police on one end who were to serve and to protect who was instigating the violence. And then on the other hand, it was. Um, an angry mob who was desirous to participate um, in this level of, uh, in in the violence that was actually happening, and so I live a life where you know it you live in fear and you live in constant fear and constantly looking over your shoulders because our political leaders also play part in that process where our, our politicians have used their, their power and position to publicly state or declare that you know gays and lesbians have no place in their cabinet and um, that. The issue on homophobia does not exist, and the, the community is over-exaggerating the realities. And within the four years that I've been involved with JFLAG, personally, 13 of my personal friends were brutally murdered. And, uh, and that's 13 of the persons who have been my housemate, or persons who I've dated, or persons who I've worked with closely. And um, you know, in that four years, it's of that 13, that expands to about, um, there were I reported cases of over 25 murders that happened in the four years that I led the organization, uh, which include lesbians who were found um, buried in, the, uh, in, in, in shallow graves in the back of their homes and covered with um, cement or concrete. And so you know, what you'll find is that with all of these things that are happening, all the, the atrocities that the government still stands and say homophobia does not exist in the Jamaican society. 
and that when gays and lesbians have been killed, it's a jealous lover or jealous partner who, who committed the crime. The crime, or when we have been beaten or chased through the streets, we have been told that you know we have been too flamboyant. And you know, it's I remember you know it, Nokia Cullen, uh, another young man, he was 21 years old, um, was going about his business one day, and was chased through the, uh, the busy streets of Kingston, and the only place that he saw as refuge, he was running towards the harbor, was to to jump into the harbor, and. The crowd was behind him, so he chose to jump into the harbor, even though he knew he couldn't swim. And the crowd stood there along with police officers and watched him gasp for breath until he, uh, you know, he drowned. And, um, and that's when they walked away. And one police officer did make a statement you know, saying uh, on, on radio, the first interview was that you know, he didn't know that this would have happened and it was wrong what actually took place. And um, that the crowd, the, the mob, who chased Nokia through the streets, you know, um, should be brought to justice. Uh, the next day, the police commissioner, they retracted that statement to say, you know, they, they can't say of a fact that Nokia uh, was chased to his death because he was a homosexual. You know, so when you live in that kind of a context and that kind of an environment where, you know, it seems hopeless. Right now in, in Jamaica, there are, um, in, in Kingston, you know, in, in the capital, there is over um, 60 gay men, young gay men, who are living on the streets, living with uh, with HIV, because again, you know, they are not able to access services. They um, they have been chased from one um, spot on the street to the next, and um, they have no sense of hope. They have no sense of community. They have no families. The youngest, the guys, young boys there who turn to sex work uh, at age 13 and 14 because nobody is willing to, to support them and to offer them services or to, to let them feel that they are part of the Jamaican society and can, and, and can contribute to our growth and development. And again, you know, it's, it's our, our, our Prime Minister, who is not, um, she did say when, um, as a part of a political campaign that it's important to review the Bogle laws and uh, we're still waiting for her to, to to turn our words into action and to start to do something about um, about the issue, and so when you find that in in operating in that context where you feel that sense of hopelessness and all you know you can uh, you're voiceless, it's it's sad, it's depressing, and for, for me personally, it's important to be able to work with organizations and groups to 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 support the cause and to support what needs to happen basically on the ground. Because of my work and my activism, when I fled to Canada in 2008, my mother too had to, to seek asylum in Canada because she is a supportive mother. And uh, so you find she, you know, she could no longer go to church uh, and feel comfortable because her church brothers and sisters would point fingers to say, oh, her son is a gay guy, her son is a J flag leader, and the list goes on. And it, it's, it's not right. It's not right to because of who you are, that your family also becomes the target and a victim of violence. And um, she also was granted conventional refugee status and protection in Canada because of I being gay, which should not be the case. It shouldn't, you know, it, it's, it's unfair. It's, it goes against my rights as, um, as, as, as a human being. Um, and, you know, it's, and it changed my mother's life. And then so it also challenges the Jamaican society also challenges our other family members, you know, who, who might be or want to be supportive of the gay relative. That you know, if you are supportive, then you're also going to be targeted, you know. And so it shows the the, the intensity of the homophobia that do exist. And so it since this year, I have uh, been working with Human Dignity Trust with a petition in front of the International Council, American Council on Human Rights. And as a result of that, and I did some interviews um, recently, my sister now has to, now lives in Canada because again of being an activist, <coughs> speaking out, challenging an unfair and unjust system, you find where you know, it's because my family supports me they, they're not able to live their life in the country that we belong to. 
uh, we're not able to be to be home at a place where we call home, where with our culture, with our other families, with our friends, being able to embrace the warmth of the Caribbean sun, not being able to, to live in the the cold weather that we're not used to. <laughs> you know? And so you know it's so you find you know, so it's you know how I look at it is do I do I be silent about the issue? Do do activists you know um, should we retreat from what uh, from from the cause or should we you know stand up? And you know for me it's it comes with consequences. And in my situation, being a Jamaican and being an out gay man and um, and also what even makes it even more complicated is you know it's the, we, I push and challenge the, the, the what is norm in, in Jamaica, and it's, you know it's so being a, now that I you know I live in Canada and able to embrace the freedoms there that exist in the society, I also choose to get married to, to my same sex partner, which again I've been my sister was at my wedding, and she's also been further ridiculed because of my uh, my activism, and so with. For me, in terms of creating the change that we want to see in, in, in the Jamaican society and across the Caribbean, it's important to work with, um, uh, it's important to do litigation, it's important to, to work with um, organizations and groups who, who are willing to partner and work with us in creating the change that we want to see in the yeah, Jamaican I think, society. Um, litigation has its, its value. Uh, as you said, you know, it's, it's not a solution. But it's, it's, a, it's a prong in terms of make, creating the change that we so want in, in, in our society. It might be seen as um, deemed to be adversarial because, you know, again, it's coming from for those who see it in that light or for those who do not want to see progressive change. And I think where we are at in, in, uh, in the Jamaican context and even internationally, we have to, um, to be more, more aggressive in our approach. I think it's, you know, the, the kind of activism that we sit and just talk and try to partner with um, our local organizations and with local end, um, human rights groups, that serves its purpose, that's another prong, but how do we create the, the systematic changes that we want to see in society? And those changes have to be done through litigations where our constitutional rights are being enforced and being, being, being brought forward. You know, yeah, it's, if we have a society where it's okay you know, people, the, our behaviors and our attitude toward gays and lesbians is, is, is a positive one, but we need to be able to anchor that with legislation. We need to be able to anchor that in a change where our judicial systems are responsive to the issues um, relating to gays and lesbians, not only a social conscience that allow for, uh, you know, the coexistence of gays and heterosexuals, but it needs to be broad this and it needs to be there something that I want to see it in black and white. Uh, and that's where I'll be able to have the confidence. Not that law, laws doesn't law, laws do not change behavior, right? But it helps to hold our political leaders and and, and civil society accountable. Uh, well, with with the time that I was in, uh, actively actively involved with JFLAG, um, there have been gay men who have been arrested and, um, and told that they're going to be charged uh, for burglary. Um, but oftentimes the cases. Uh, get dropped or they have not been charged or they have been released. But um, one person I know, um, his name is Wayne Elliott, he was arrested and char um, charged for burglary um, and uh, he died. He died two if weeks see, after he was arrested. If uh, we can relate or contribute the, the increase in each, uh, va uh, charges like in Cameroon to the gay community, the international community, I think it's it's more the reason why this work needs to be continued. It's more the reason why these laws need to be changed. Uh, you know, because it's if we, for me, and I don't know, sometimes I uh, might be deemed to be selfish. Is if we constant, if we're constantly concerned all about, you know, if my action is going to create a ripple effect on, you know, ten more gay people and make their lives much more harder, do I do it or not do it? And it's a tough decision. It's something we have to, you know consciously wrestle with, but then at the end of the day, is it does it feel right? Is it the we right thing to, uh, at this point in time? You know, be not visible. We have to be visible. And with that visibility, it's going to create challenges. Uh, and it's, you know, it's how do we, as local organizations, as an international community, 
stand in solidarity with each other and support each other with the work that needs to be done because it's until, you know, I live in Canada where there's freedom, so we can do whatever we want to do, but I'm not truly free until gays and lesbians across the world is free. You know, and that is just a reality. It's, you know, so it's, yeah, as a Canadian, you know, we can be quiet, be, it's fine, but when I travel elsewhere, I have to be concerned, you know, what this environment is. So it's, you know, as an international community, we have a role to play in that process, and that is how do we create this change for us.